10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, live from Jerusalem, as Israel's war cabinet debates its next steps. The world urges restraint with fears of further escalation around the region after the weekend's attacks. And the UK government calls Iran's actions reckless and dangerous. We are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. Tonight, Israel says Iran will be met with a response and it will do whatever necessary to protect the state. We'll analyze what that response could be. And we'll get the latest from the people here as blood drives open up in preparation for war. Also tonight on Sky News at 10. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Donald Trump goes to court, officially becoming the first former US president to be on criminal trial. A new daily record for small boat crossings in the Channel as MPs return to vote on the Rwanda bill. The six people killed in the Sydney shopping centre attack are named as the parents of the attacker say sorry for their son with a mental illness. If he was in his right mind, he would be absolutely devastated at what he's done. But he obviously was not in his right mind. He somehow had been triggered into a psychosis and he'd lost touch with reality. And wild weather and a suspected tornado with yellow weather warnings in place for England and Northern Ireland. Plus, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Good evening from Jerusalem in Israel, where tonight this region and the entire world wait nervously to see how Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet will respond to the attack by Iran when more than 330 drones and missiles were launched towards this airspace. Rishi Sunak said that Israel has the full support of the UK, but while he urged restraint, he said that although Iran has shown its true colours, it is important to prevent escalation. Israel's military said they will do whatever necessary to protect itself. Tonight, we look at what could be the next move with analysis from our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes. But Sky's international correspondent, Alex Rossi, has tonight's first report. Israel and its allies may have taken out the Iranian missiles and drones, but this crisis is far from over. We filmed the interception above Jerusalem on Saturday as sirens wailed. And there's pressure from some members of the Israeli government to respond aggressively to show this unprecedented attack has serious consequences. This was the damage at the Nevatim Air Base in southern Israel. The IDF says it remains on high alert. This base is still operational around the clock. The IDF is altogether still ready to protect the state of Israel. We are preparing and following any developments. The country's war cabinet has met again for the third time in 48 hours. Several retaliatory options were reportedly discussed. But Iran says after its operation for the consulate airstrike, the matter is concluded. They are warning if Israel does attack, they will hit back. The Islamic Republic of Iran is not seeking to escalate tensions in the region. The Islamic Republic of Iran at every stage will act more strongly to create deterrence and punish aggressors for any illegal or illogical action. Israel then faces a dilemma. Its security policy is founded on showing strength, do nothing and the danger is looking weak in a region where hard power often wins the day. Whilst it's still not clear what will be Israel's response, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under pressure from allies to show restraint. The danger is of a cycle of retaliation that escalates into a full-blown regional war. The country's military, though, says it is keeping all options on the table, and that includes both defensive and offensive actions. In the House of Commons, Rishi Sunak emphasised the need to step back from the brink. We are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. 
We want to see calmer heads prevail, and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. For Israelis, this is an anxious time. Since Saturday, more people have been coming forward to donate blood. There is a sense of national emergency and a need to do something. Saturday night was something very, very new because there was a certain sense of vulnerability for a few hours until we, our, our faith in our army uh, paid off and the Air Force. Um, but yeah, these are difficult times. As Israel grapples with how to respond to Iran, it is still fighting on two other fronts. This is a dangerous moment for the entire Middle East. And at present, there is no clear way out of this crisis. Alex Rossi, Sky News, Jerusalem. Well, in a moment, we'll get the thoughts of our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who joins us from Beirut, and in Westminster, political editor Beth Rigby, and our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, joins me here live in Jerusalem. But first, as the world urges Iran and Israel not to escalate this further, let's just take a look at what the response could be. Sky's security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, reports. Israel has said it will respond to Iran's unprecedented strike against its territory, even though most of the missiles and drones were shot down. The key questions are how, when, and whether calls for restraint from allies will make a difference. I think this is a time to think with, with, with head as well as heart, and to be smart as well as tough. And I think the smart thing to do is actually to recognise that Iran's attack was a failure. Uh, and we want to keep the focus on that, on, on Iran's malign influence. There are a range of possible options for an Israeli response, from going big with direct military action to heeding the advice of David Cameron and others and doing nothing. The most aggressive choice could involve deploying F-35 jets to bomb nuclear facilities inside Iran. This could include sites such as Natanz, Iraq and Fordow. Another option could be to target Iranian military bases. A less aggressive move could be to conduct more deniable operations, such as assassinating key military commanders or possibly using a cyber attack to disrupt the country. Back up the response scale could be the option of going after Iran's proxy militias, such as by launching a ground invasion into next door Lebanon to take on Hezbollah. For Tehran and its Revolutionary Guard Corps, they have unsurprisingly vowed to retaliate even more harshly to any Israeli action. The bigger the Israeli attack, the larger the Iranian response and the greater the risk of escalation into uncontrolled regional conflict. It's why leaving the threat of a response hanging for as long as possible, rather than acting quickly, might make more sense for Israel, especially as it's already waging war against Hamas in Gaza and defending its northern border from Hezbollah. The weekend strikes also saw the US, Britain, France and regional Arab nations work together to help defend Israel Nurturing that kind of coalition against Iran, rather than hastily going it alone, could serve Israel best in the long run. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. Well, to the north of here, Israel shares a border with Lebanon. The military here and Hezbollah have been engaging in tit-for-tat fighting across the border since Israel started its military operation in Gaza. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, joins me now live from Beirut. And, Alex, um, we understand a number of uh, Israeli soldiers have been injured in an explosion there. Just bring us up to date. Another step down the road of provocation. We've been hearing for the first time acknowledgement that Israeli soldiers have entered Lebanese territory. They were found several hundred metres inside Lebanon. According to Hezbollah and the IDF, who've both acknowledged that this has happened the first time since October the 7th, the men, the soldiers, were advancing into uh, Lebanon. They made uh, their way towards Tel Ismail. Uh, there were some buried explosive devices, according to Hezbollah. They monitored, they saw them crossing, and as soon as they reached those explosive devices, they detonated that. Four of them were injured, three of them 
uh, not so badly, it seems, one perhaps more seriously. I think a lot of questions being asked now, certainly amongst the Lebanese authorities and the Lebanese people, about what exactly they were doing inside Lebanon, and was this the first time? The indications are it probably wasn't the first time. We're hearing reports of uh, a possible execution which the Lebanese authorities are putting down to Mossad of, of a, a Hamas uh, a supporter, Hezbollah supporter, who was raising funds and funneling them to um, Hamas just, just last week. Certainly this is going to do nothing to calm tensions which are already very high here in Lebanon, particularly along the border where thousands of people have been displaced on both sides of the border. And uh, the Lebanese authorities are regularly complaining about Israeli drones, Israeli jets, and now Israeli soldiers breaching their territory, Yalda. Alex, uh, thank you so much for that update there. Well, let's bring in our political editor, Beth Rigby, who joins me now live. And, um, Beth, we saw there at the top of uh, Alex Rossi's piece uh, where the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak uh, said that he stands by Israel and, and supports Israel, but, but they're also calling for restraint, world leaders. Yes, that's right, Yauda. Uh, such a tense moment, such a dangerous moment. And what you're seeing is allies working in absolute lockstep, weighing every word so carefully there in the Commons today. The Prime Minister, like others, absolutely doesn't want to throw a match into the tinderbox of the Middle East. And they are doing everything that they can to dissuade Israel from retaliating, from striking uh, back at Iran. If you think about what's happened, there was a successful military effort over the weekend and together allies and regional partners managed to intercept those projectiles, bring them down uh, and avoid this escalation. As the Prime Minister spokesperson uh, said earlier today, had that attack been successful, it's hard to overestimate the fallout for regional instability. So that achieved what next? Well, now frantic diplomacy as allies work together to try and dissuade Israel from escalating, having been successful over the weekend in seeing off uh, that attack. The Prime Minister today with a clear message to Israel, which was, we are unwavering in our support for Israel as the UK government, and also indicating that there could be further sanctions on the way uh, for Iran, working in lockstep with the G7, something also the Secretary of State of the US, Antony Blinken, has talked about. So a message there uh, to Israel. But for Iran, you saw MPs in the House of Commons today, Conservative MPs, calling on the Prime Minister uh, to, to uh, describe the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organisation. He demurred from doing that. Why? Quite simply because the Foreign Office here still want a direct line into Tehran. That's the diplomatic effort that's going on. David Cameron uh, could be going to the Middle East uh, in the coming days. The Prime Minister could be speaking to Benjamin Netanyahu in the coming days. But it's not in their hands. All eyes on Israel tonight, uh, here and over the Atlantic, allies saying to the Israelis, take the win, but will they heed that call? Beth, uh, thank you so much uh, for all of that. And uh, the team and I here in Jerusalem will be back at the end of the news at 10 with more analysis. I'll have our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, uh, with me here. But for now, back to you, Anna, in the studio. Yalda, thank you. An assault on America, an assault on our country. That was Donald Trump's remarks as he entered the courtroom in New York to become the first former US president to face a criminal trial. He's accused of trying to cover up paying hush money to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Well, Mr Trump has just headed home after day one of jury selection, with no jurors selected, proceedings to resume tomorrow. Sky's US correspondent James Matthews reports now from New York. In midtown Manhattan, he stepped out and stepped in to the history books. The long arm of the law beckoned Donald Trump downtown. For a first former president to be criminally prosecuted, this was the first day of his trial. The people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, even if he called it by another name.
This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Donald Trump The crowds for and against were out for this. One of four trials that Donald Trump faces. I think it's all a hoax, and they're not going to get Donald Trump. It might be the only trial before the November election. We are one step closer to holding him accountable. This is the so-called hush money case relating to former porn star Stormy Daniels. She claimed that she had an affair with Trump. He's accused of paying her to keep the story quiet before the 2016 election. The alleged crime is that he put the payment through the company books as something else. In the building where New York prosecutes its criminals, a court on the 15th floor began picking jurors who will decide the fate of the former president. These are pictures from inside court. When Trump was introduced to potential jurors as the defendant, he was seen to deliver what was described as a tight-lipped smirk. If a 12-member jury ultimately convicts Donald Trump, it won't necessarily lead to his imprisonment. It is highly unlikely, because it's not a violent crime, that he will get sentenced to jail. I can see if he's convicted that he would be sentenced to probation or even community service. You can see Donald Trump cleaning up the streets as part of a sentence. Or he can be sentenced to jail, but I think that's highly unlikely. While the circus ensued outside court, inside the wheels of justice began to roll. Donald Trump's defense team asked that the judge step down, withdraw from the case. The judge, Juan Marchand, denied that and delayed a ruling on a separate request that he be given a day off from court on the 17th of May to attend his son's high school graduation. It was the procedural start of a court case that will decide one man's guilt or innocence. And so much more. James Matthews, Sky News in New York. Parliament has returned after the Easter break, digesting the latest developments in the Middle East, but also today voting on the government's controversial Rwanda bill. The bill passed in the House of Commons earlier this year, but the House of Lords attached a series of amendments which MPs have this evening rejected. Sky's political correspondent Rob Powell has this report. A break in the weather brings more boats across the Channel. Far from them being stopped, Sunday saw more than 530 people arrive, the highest daily number this year. It comes as the Rwanda bill returns to the Commons and ministers push for changes made by the Lords to be removed. We simply cannot accept amendments that provide for loopholes which would perpetuate the current cycle of delays and late legal challenges to removal. We have a moral duty to stop the boat. Vision, clear the lobby. And come the votes, the government did get its way. The eyes have it. MPs removed all of the Lord's amendments, including exemptions for victims of modern slavery and those who worked with the British military, as well as changes that would allow more legal challenges. Little internal dissent, many Tories now just wanting progress. It's the only game in town in terms of how you deal with people who are impossible to deport to their home countries, who have no credible asylum claim, coming to UK in small boats the most inappropriate and dangerous uh, way. Other one-time Tory critics now placated, if not convinced. I hope the words are sufficiently clear and unambiguous, uh, because if they're not, then the Supreme Court may well rule against the government. But we shall see. And this is why MPs want action. Small boat arrivals passed 45,000 in 2022. That dropped by more than a third in 2023, but the total for 2024 so far is slightly higher when compared to the same point two years ago. The parliamentary process of ping pong will see the Rwanda bill return to the Lords where it may well be amended again. It's thought that eventually peers will back down though, meaning that it could become law before the end of the week. But refugee groups are planning individual legal challenges, believing there will still be avenues for court action. Some ministers resigned over the issue, saying that this isn't good enough and the loophole still exists. So um, while some ministers might say there's no opportunity for challenge, we believe that there still are opportunities. Two years after the Rwanda scheme was unveiled, three home secretaries have gone to the African state, but as yet no migrants. This week may see a significant step taken towards that happening, 
but the Prime Minister's pledge to stop the boats still seems some way off. Rob Powell, Sky News in Westminster. The parents of Joel Cauchy have said they are heartbroken and extremely sorry after their son killed six people in Sydney at the weekend. Five of the victims were women and detectives are now investigating what motivated the killer. Sky's Nicole Johnston reports. Sydney siders paying their respects to the victims of Saturday's stabbing spree at Bondi Junction's Westfield Shopping Centre. Quiet moments to reflect and remember the lives lost. Across the country and on the most iconic sites of this harbour city, flags at half-mast. Australians are not used to this type of tragedy. Police say it appears women were the target. Five of the six victims were female. It's obvious to detectives that that um, seems to be uh, an area of interest that the offender had focused on women and avoided the men. The killer, Joel Culchy, lived an itinerant life. It's unclear what led him to pick up a knife and run through a shopping mall stabbing strangers. His parents say he suffered from schizophrenia. I'm extremely sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. I, look, this is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. You, you're trying to give me to give you an intelligent conversation. I can't do it because I'm just devastated. I love yeah. my son. I made myself a servant to my son when I found out he had a mental illness. Mm. I became his servant. I did everything because I love that boy. This is a parent's absolute nightmare when they have a child with mental illness, that something like this would happen. And my heart goes out to the people our son has hurt. If he was in his right mind, he would be absolutely devastated at what he has done. But he obviously was not in his right mind. He somehow had been triggered into a psychosis and he'd lost touch with reality. The last victim has been named. Chang, its son, a Chinese student. Ashley Good was also killed in the attack. Her nine-month-old daughter was stabbed as well. Reports now that the baby's condition has improved, but it is still serious. I've spoken to family members uh, yesterday and they're doing it tough because this act of senseless violence uh, has uh, shocked uh, the nation and we all grieve with them uh, today. Australians are asking how and why did this attack happen? Right now, there are few answers to give. Nicole Johnston, Sky News. Well, only two days after that attack, four people, including a bishop, were stabbed at a church in Sydney. A video on social media showed a man approaching the bishop during a service, who then apparently stabbed him repeatedly. A man has been arrested and four people were treated for injuries which are not thought to be life-threatening. The Duke of Sussex has lost an initial bid to appeal against a High Court ruling concerning his personal security. Prince Harry is fighting a Home Office decision to offer him a different level of protection since he stopped being a working royal. He can still apply for permission to bring an appeal despite today's decision. Scientists are warning that coral reefs around the world are suffering from a second mass bleaching event in less than a decade. Warming oceans have triggered the bleaching, seen in some 54 countries and territories, when stressed coral expel algae, which is both their food source and gives them their unique colour. If bleaching is severe and long-lasting, the coral will die, damaging fragile marine ecosystems. The weapons supervisor on the set of the film Rust has been sentenced to 18 months in jail for killing the production, production cinematographer. Prosecutors said Hannah Gutierrez-Reed loaded the gun fired by Alec Baldwin when he shot Helena Hutchins in October 2021. She'd already been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Parents of children who were in end-of-life care where they disagreed with doctors over treatment have called on the UK's highest court to allow them to name the clinicians involved. They've already won their case at the Court of Appeal, but NHS trusts are challenging that ruling to protect the privacy of medical staff. Shman Freeman-Powell reports now from the Supreme Court. A father fighting for better care for his six-year-old daughter, handcuffed and dragged through an ICU. Weeks later, 
doctors were granted permission to withdraw treatment that was keeping Zainab alive. Years later, and the Abbasi family say that they want the doctors who made that decision named. I would say I'm a tough cookie and it's broken us. It's like having a nuclear bomb thrown into your family. In any profession, you should be accountable for what you do because if you're held to account, you know, you'll hold yourself to better standards. The NHS Trust involved in Zainab's care says there have been no findings of fault against any member of staff involved. As an employer, we have a duty to protect the well-being and safety of our clinical teams who work tirelessly to support their patients. It's this duty that restricts what the parents can say. And the father of Azaya, also involved in this case, says the legal process is compounding his pain. But you don't grieve when you're fighting, you grieve afterwards, don't you? Um, when you're still, I think I'm going to start grieving after, after the Supreme Court judgment because it's all in your head, there's no um, finality, so you're still here fighting. So I've not actually grieved, really. The family say they want transparency, but reporting restrictions prevent them from being able to name the medics responsible for their children's care. NHS trusts say that their medics should have the right to anonymity and are asking the Supreme Court to uphold restrictions indefinitely in an attempt to protect their staff from potential abuse. If a doctor or indeed other professionals are identified, that might lead somebody to um, perhaps make abusive phone calls to them or send text or publicise things on Facebook and stuff. So sometimes it's about uh, protecting their professional reputation. The arguments at the Supreme Court this week will be complicated, but the main issue, simple. Does the doctor's right to privacy outweigh a family's request for transparency? Shaman Freeman Powell, Sky News. Now, it's been a wet and windy day across the country, with pretty much all of the UK bus Scotland and the northeast of England covered by a yellow weather warning from the Met Office. But this morning, residents in the Staffordshire village of Nutton uh, were left surprised after experiencing a suspected tornado. Sky's Emma Birchley went to meet them. It arrived without warning. Wild winds whipping through the street at 6.30 a.m. Then this. A closer look shows tiles torn from roofs and a trampoline hurtling through the air. And almost as quickly as it came, it was gone. It came through from the church up on Nutton Lane and it just swept straight through. Steve Hemmings thinks his dad's caravan and van are probably write-offs. Every single person that uh, turned up here, they were just absolutely gobsmacked. They, they all had exactly the same reaction as I did. When they got down to the, you know, the, the street, they just stopped mouth open and stood going, what's happened? Clearing the glass from his driveway next door, Michael Waring was in no doubt what caused it. It was definitely a tornado because Paul was by the front and I was by the back and you heard it wind up like a hoover. And then he come across there, bounced off the house, which took a lamppost out. The whole f***ing tree's in the garden. The sight for some was clearly a shock. Trees felled trampolines toppled. The emergency services were quick to arrive, making sure the remaining roof tiles were secure as the community and local housing association pulled together to clear up. Eight-year-old Hunter headed out first thing with his little brother Ryder, who's six, to investigate. He went me up and he just started raining a lot and I heard lightning. And what did you see, Ryder? What did you see in terms of the lightning? You were telling me about that. It was a purple lightning. The path of the powerful gust was as narrow as it was short-lived, all over in under a minute. The Met Office is assessing whether it was indeed a tornado or simply an almighty gust of wind. Either way, it was an unexpected wake-up call for this small slice of Staffordshire. Emma Birchley, Sky News, Nutton.
Welcome back to Jerusalem, where there are reports that Israel wants to carry out action against Iran, but coordinated with the U.S. That's according to Israeli media. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met his war cabinet for the third time today. Well, let me uh, bring in our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, who's here with me um, in Jerusalem. And Dom, I mean, we've been hearing a lot of uh, things being reported uh, throughout the day, especially by Israeli media. What we do know is in the last 24 hours, the war cabinet has met at least three or four times and uh, you know they're in agreement that they need to do something but the question is what right all we've, all we've heard in terms of uh, public uh, comments on this is from Herzia Levy the chief of staff that they will respond but in terms of of how there's, there's no clear idea which is hearing from unnamed sources a, a bunch of leaks and, and reports I think it's really important to get into the the mindset of Israelis uh, and what happened on Saturday what it what it meant to them Iran to them is, is the great villain the great threat acutely aware of the danger of, of a country that regards Israel as a little Satan um, that talks about wiping Israel off the face of the map, that supports you know all these all these groups, the ha Hamas, Hezbollah, and uh, the Houthis. What they have in common with Iran is a belief that Israel should not exist. So the fact that for the first time in 30 years Israel was attacked by another country, and that country was Iran, and what was thrown this way, they might have all been shot down, uh, and some of them failed. But the, the sight of some of these very big missiles that were sent towards Israel is really chilling for Israelis, and that's why feelings are running so high here and why this debate is, is, is really quite polarising. On the one hand, you have right-wing politicians uh, saying that uh, this has to be punished. Whatever the calls for restraints and calm from the White House, from Downing Street, from other allies, um, the, the Iranians have to be taught a lesson. Otherwise, the next time they tr choose to attack, they won't telegraph a warning in advance. They'll, they'll do so by surprise and some of these big mass missiles could get through and that has to be deterred. On the other hand, people like Yura Ireland, a major general who you interviewed an hour or so ago, he's saying, look, you've got to think about the bigger issues, the bigger threat that Iran poses, which is its alleged nuclear programme. The only way you're going to deal with that, you can't do it single-handedly. As a small country, Israel can't neutralise that. It needs the support of America. You've got to keep countries like America but other allies on side, and you've got to build an international coalition to eventually neutralise that. If you attack Iran single-handedly, you're going to jeopardise that coalition that showed such promise on Saturday. So there's a huge amount at stake, and I think that's why we're seeing this being deliberated over, why we're hearing a lot of different opinions and, and uh, leaks coming out. Um, and I think, obviously, the outcome of that decision will be fundamentally important for the stability of the region in the weeks ahead. Yeah, and we'll be watching all of those developments as this war enters a new kind of phase. Well, that's it from the team uh, and me here in Jerusalem. Back to you in London. Yelda, Dominic, thank you. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, joined by the political editors of The Sun and The Guardian, Harry Cole and Hibakura. And certainly among the stories we will be discussing this on the front of The Guardian, its headline, Washington believes retaliation is inevitable uh, as it hopes for a limited strike. Talk about more on that in just a moment.
Well, this is Sky News. In just a moment, the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, a reminder of our top stories this evening. Israel has said again that it will respond to Iran's attack over the weekend, but is still not said how. Jury selection has begun in Donald Trump's criminal trial over hush money payments to a porn actress. And MPs have passed the government's controversial bill to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. Hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the political editors of The Sun and The Guardian, Harry Cole and Pippa Kura. Welcome to both of you. So to the front pages then, let us start with the Financial Times reporting on the efforts of the US and its European allies to dissuade Israel from striking back against Iran. It's also the lead story for The Eye with the headline, Britain and US tell Netanyahu don't start a world war with Iran revenge. The Guardian says Washington believes Israeli retaliation is inevitable as it hopes for a limited strike against Iran. Rishi Sunak has rejected calls to prescribe Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organisation, according to The Times. That is also the lead for The Express, with Ian Duncan Smith criticising the failure to outlaw them as, so far, rather as absurd. Iran is acting like a bully and must be hit back twice as hard, according to the former Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, uh, speaking The Telegraph. An image of Donald Trump dominates the front of the Metro, which says the former president accused prosecutors of political persecution as he became the first former president to stand criminal trial. Daily Mirror leads with the widow of murdered Gary Newlove describing the terror of living as a target of antisocial behaviour. Baron Newlove wants legislation to protect families. The Daily Mail has the culture secretary telling sporting chiefs it's time to ban trans women from female sports. The Sun says TV presenter Holly Willoughby is protected by a £1 million ring of steel. Well, the star reports on celebrity Vicky Patterson being refused a onto a flight due to her damaged passport eaten by the dog. Uh, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. So let's head to Harry and to Pippa. Um, you know, plenty to talk about, obviously, after what happened at the weekend. Is there a sense, do you think, in Whitehall that there will be some imminency to whatever Israel decides to do, Harry? Yeah, I think there'll be some late nights in the MOD and the Foreign Office tonight, um, whether it happens tonight, whether it happens in the next 24 hours, everyone's on extremely high alert. I think one of the papers saying that uh, yeah, the US accepting that some form of response is going to be inevitable, it's what that response is now, and then what does that response lead to from Iran? Uh, obviously, what we saw on Saturday night um, was fairly remarkable coordination by the West to shoot down these 99% of these 300 missiles. I think the worry is, in some quarters, is will they be able to do that again? Um, once you do a sort of, uh, an operation of that scale and that size once, well, the very obvious thing that Iran would do in a, in, in a future circumstance is we'll, we'll do things slightly differently to try and avoid where they're going to get shot down, how they did it. And so I think the message that's being sent to Israel is, look, we're, we're standing with you, but, you know, just be careful because we might not be able to put on that sort of display again uh, and consistently if this, if this starts to escalate. So, bated breath, I think, tonight. I think something will probably happen, but whether it will be a direct strike on Israel, I mean, um, on Iran by Israel, remains to be seen. I mean, fascinatingly, Iran works through proxies. That's mm. why this is mm -hmm. so extraordinary. The question is, will Israel take the win, as Joe Biden has hinted, or will they break the China, I think the quote was. Ah. And the fear is that the deterrent of Israel and its force seems to no longer work against Iran, and that's what they're trying to claim back, isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, there's been a real tightrope between, between deterrence and escalation for Israel in, in working out what the response will be, but I don't think... Even the US administration now suspect, thinks that, um, that Israel, that Tel Aviv will follow their advice to take the win on this, that, that it's inevitable there will be, as Harry says, some sort of response. But you know, that doesn't necessarily mean um, a full-scale military response into Iranian territory. As you say, Iran has operated via proxies. Could there be a situation, for example, where Israel decides to target an Iranian military base in Syria 
or in Iraq or, or indeed um, um, some of their sort of supporters with Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, could it be a sort of a wide scale cyber attack? We've seen those in the past, um, probably by Israel in, in Iran, um, specifically targeted nuclear installations, not just the nuclear power network, but obviously the big concern that Israel has and some of the hardliners in the Israeli war cabinet have is about what potential is Iran may have for developing nuclear weapons. Do we see a covert operation where they target um, those sorts of those nu that nuclear development um, from, uh, from Israeli special forces? You know, there's a variety of different approaches Mm. that they could take that don't quite hit the sort of the very uh, escalatory think, threshold uh, of a direct attack on Iranian the, soil. I think the problem is is that the phenomenal scale of the Iranian response is going to require, you know, it's not the sort of thing you can just let slide. They fired 300 yeah. drones and ballistic For missiles. The first time just because they didn't yeah. land doesn't mean they didn't try to do it. If the, if the sort of US and UK and French and um, various sophisticated uh, air defences hadn't been in place, this would have been a horrific... Um, attack on Israel. So I do think it was, you know, everyone's talking of calling for Israel to de-escalate. I mean, the, the OTT response to Iran, you know, it's, you know, these, these stakes are incredibly high but here. But some suggested that slow-moving drones, you know, designed to be shot down effectively... Well, tell, that to, tell that to the Ukrainians, because they don't have that. I know these, 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 you know, Zelensky's been out tonight and said, you know, where are my surface to air missiles? Exactly. Where's my, where are my air defenses? These, these things, you know, do land. They, yes, yeah. they take, you know, it's a very, Iraq is a very big country for these things to have crossed. It will take a long time, but you can't just rely, Iran can't just rely on the West being there to, to, you know, sort of allow them to spare their blushes by firing all this firepower into the air. This is, this was, this was a deliberate attack. This wasn't a, a stage managed, mm -hmm. um, sort of show, show, you know, these weren't fireworks. Yeah, I know you want to come in. Just, oh, let, just a couple of other newspapers quickly. The yeah. I, Britain and US tell Netanyahu, don't start a world war with Iran revenge. You know, a reminder that the stakes are extremely high here. And at the Financial Times as well, similarly, US and Europe in frantic diplomacy to deter Israel from striking back at Iran. Pipper, yeah, and it may well, be, well, it may well be too late. Um, I mean, the US, as we say, seems to recognise that there will be some sort of response. What it has been clear on, however, in all those conversations between Netanyahu and Biden, uh, between Antony Blinken and his counterparts as well, um, is that the US will not get involved um, overtly in, in, a, in overt action, um, military action against Iran. It does not want to get involved in a conflict mm. with Iran. So while it will, it will, and actually the UK and France have both said this as well, while it will be there to help defend Israel, and we saw that with um, the RAF backfilling for the US um, over Syria and Iraq, but also taking down a few drones themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the same for the French forces as well. Um, the, the, French RA, the French Air Force as well. Um, what they will not do is, is get involved in, in attacks because that would, I mean, that would be much, much more serious and, um, and you know, really push, push the Middle East to the brink of a much more, a much broader um, conflict, which nobody wants to see. You wonder how much people are actually listening to Biden as well. He said to the Iranians, you know, what's your message to Iran on Friday? They said, don't do this. And they did it. Mm. And you got the kind of get the feeling. Well, Gaza that, as well, though. Well, exactly. Well, I was just going to say, you've got the sort of, you know, tensions as we discussed, I think, two weeks ago, right yep. here. You know, tensions between Netanyahu and Biden, the relationship is, you know, it's in a it's pretty poor state. So actually, you know, the West, they can say it all they like, mm. but, you know, you've got, a, you've got an Israeli audience to deal with as much as an international audience. And, you know, can you really let it stand to have that level of attempted attack on your soil and not? and not come back on it. Yeah, let's take a look at the Times. Uh, the Prime Minister rejecting mounting calls to ban this... Um, <laughs> Again. <laughs> Iran group. We've had it before. The Sun inside pages as well. Uh, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak facing mounting calls to class Iran's Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organisation following the massive attack on Israel. Uh, demands to follow the lead set by America came from mm. ex-Home Secretary Suella Bravman, former Tory leader Ian Douglas Smith and the Labour Party. Pepper. Yeah, um, I mean, this is a call that has uh, that's so far been rejected by David Cameron um, and Rishi Sunak um, for, for the group to be prescribed. The, the um, uh, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, known as the, I, the IRGC, to be prescribed. The, the, the concern that the Foreign Office have and that Number 10 has is that diplomatic channels need to remain open. Mm. I mean, we asked the question of Downing Street today, well, what are the advantages of the diplomatic channels? And I mean, 
maybe they wouldn't have told us anyway, but they, they've struggled to give us a response as to what the advantages of those diplomatic channels might be. But also the security forces, security services value having a presence, um, a, a relationship with, um, yeah. with Iran. It is better to know what is going on than be completely blind, I think, is, That's the, the, for, is, yeah. the, is the thinking. Um, but, uh, but clearly, you know, IR, the IRGC has operated via proxies in, in other uh, conflicts in the region, and Sunak spoke a lot for today. For 40 years, for a very yeah. long time. Yeah. And Sunak, um, in the Commons today, was talking about how they are intent on sowing um, chaos in their own backyard, and you only need to look at, at Iraq, at Syria, at Lebanon, I mean, let alone with the yeah. current situation, to see um, that, they're, that they're not neutral actors and in the sphere. Possibly in our own backyard as well. There's, you know, fears that they're operating with impunity on the streets of London already. It's interesting, there's a bit of a cabinet split on this, because James Cleverley obviously was the Foreign Secretary, mm -hmm. who was very adamant to taking that line that, you know, the, this idea that basically the US have asked us not to do this, because they banned the IRG, and then actually things made it very complicated. A little bit like the Communist Party in the, in the old Soviet Union. A lot of people who are diplomats and, and officials are members of the IRG as part of just the, being a part of the state. Whereas actually, we'd have to kick out a lot of people from the, if you prescribe them, you'd have to kick out a lot of people in Iran who, as Pippa said, are a back channel between, we are essentially a back channel between the US. There's a suggestion from some sources I speak to that the US have directly asked us not to do this. So all of this stuff about following the US's lead is they, they actually, they don't necessarily regret it, but they found life a lot more complicated since they, since they put them in the deep freeze. And actually having that channel open is quite useful. But James Cleverly was at the Foreign Office, you know, pushing the keep communications open. He's now at the Home Office, and it's the Home Office that's been pushing really hard to have the IRG, especially under Suella Braveman and Priti Patel before her, and the Security Minister Tom Tugendhat. So he's in a weird place where he's now sort of should be pushing the Home Office line, but he's still, still pushing the Foreign Office line, if that makes sense. It does. Fascinating stuff. Um, next up, we'll have uh, more of Mr Trump, parents in court, as you might know, and uh, look at Harry's sit-down with Liz Truss. We can see he <laughs> has very few regrets. We'll see if he sums it up that way. Back in a moment. It's insane, honestly. I've been a normal wave surfer, I guess we'll call it at this point, uh, since I was nine years old. So this crossover into the big wave surfing has been, uh, yeah, just like a natural progression, I think, as I have grown as a woman and, um, yeah, just found a bit more power from within. It's just kind of led me to this big wave world, which is so many different things, adrenaline, yeah, just everything. I started training for big wave surfing, so it's a little bit different to normal surfing. Normal surfing, you obviously paddle, use your arms, and that's how you get into the waves. With this stuff, you have a jet ski with a rope on the back that you hold on to. It goes about 70 kilometers an hour, and you just hold on, and you decide whether or not you're gonna let go. So I started doing this in June, which was a pretty quick Wow. Um, progression and, and uh, yeah, to surfing Nazare then in in the November for the first time and then I caught the, the big wave more towards the end of the season. I think probably the first time in my life that I felt that much pride um, mm -hmm. and just the reaction that I've had from the UK and just like women as, as a whole and how they've kind of said that it's inspired them to go after their 60 foot wave and whatever that is so I think as much as the wave felt incredible for me on a personal level, I think how it's kind of now evolving into, into lots of other things and the kind messages and everything that I've had has been, yeah, it's all together been just incredible. They basically have to have an object like in front. So usually with us, it's a jet ski that they can oh. kind of guarantee that the jet ski is this size and they okay. can kind of like, so it's a certain amount of jet skis, so I don't know, like 12 jet skis. Uh, and that's how they do it. So for the Guinness record it is, um, yeah, measured by jet skis effectively. <laughs> I'd uh, been in sport since I was 15 years old competitively and I think that took a real hit on my mental health. I really struggled with an eating disorder and, and back in the days when I first started surfing, it was over 20 years ago, there wasn't much representation for women and we were definitely valued more for our appearance than our physical ability. So. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a journey for sure. I, I took four years out of surfing just to kind of find who Laura was outside of that, and yeah, just uh, pulled me straight back in. But it, it's it, as I said, it's been amazing to have the support this time round as an athlete.
Welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Harry Cole and Pippa Curry, keeping abreast of the news. Good to see you. <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, let's take a look at something that happened today, which is Donald Trump became the first uh, US president, former US president, to face criminal trial. Jury selection, maybe, no jurors selected, but the man was, uh, was sat in court, Pippa. Yeah, not looking very happy, was he? And he's likely to be sitting there for some time because I think the first week of this trial is going to be taken out, taken up with sort of procedure before they actually get to the substance of it. And of course, this is just one of four cases that he's facing. This, of course, is over the hush money that he allegedly paid to um, Stormy Daniels, the porn star, to keep her quiet from um, from you know, divulging their relationship ahead of the 2016 presidential election. He also briefly faces one for the Capitol riot, um, mm. uh, the, the insurrection, alleged insurrection, um, for, for trying to stitch up the Georgia result um, in 2020. That and, one's on um, tape as well, which and, I think might be Yeah, yeah, slightly problematic, and also, yeah. and also ha having classified documents, boxes of them mm. at Mar-a-Lago. So um, this particular one um, is the first of them, and it, it is, as he told us uh, in very colourful terms, um, a historic moment, but probably for him for the but, wrong reasons. Uh, saying it's a stitch-up as well, I mean, but, I mean, there's some brilliant colour in the, uh, I think, the Times report. It says there's 96 candidates for jurors. And they were asked to do a show of hands, and 50 of them said they were unable to not be biased against him. So, <laughs> which is obviously very quick, very obvious, and easy um, way to get out of jury service, is obviously <laughs> so, you, <laughs> so you can't. But I think it does do suspect that in New York he might prove. Uh, it might prove a little tricky to find a, uh, a balanced jury, which is one of his big complaints about this. Well, they're going to day two, possibly day three. Exactly. Or, or, anyway, yeah. we'll but, see, I mean, this is prime campaigning time that he's going to be told that he has to sit in this court. Meanwhile, he's yeah. sitting there falling in asleep, sleep, apparently, yeah. today. Sleepy. Got one minute left for you Sleepy. to talk to us about... Very quickly, his trust, talking of sell, former Blonde the Bombshell leaders plotting comebacks, but not in court. Um, <laughs> Liz Trust has been on a sort of whirlwind today. She's got a book out tomorrow. Um, and she did a bit of an interview with her. She was very open about what the Queen said, at quite a poignant moment. Mm -hmm. She said, "See you next. See you next. I'll see you again next week." The last time she saw her, of course, she was she was gone two days later. Mm -hmm. But um, that was um, among more of the sort of reflective moments of Liz Truss. Look, <laughs> it was uh, quite lively. She wants to abolish the Supreme Court, the OBR, leave the ECHR, abolish the UN, uh, and she had sort of go at national uh, natural England. Yeah, uh, part of the conspiracy against her. Uh, but Governor of the Bank of England should resign and she doesn't rule out a comeback. And that was just the first 10 minutes of it. There's 26, <laughs> the, there's 26 the, whole minutes of, of it greatest, on YouTube. One of the greatest you mysteries of modern politics is Liz Truss's self-belief. Well, someone <laughs> said she is the, the opposite of... She, has to, she suffers from the opposite of imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. We don't know if there's a correct word for that. No, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll find one by business. the end of our show. Unfinished business, she told well, us. So she's, yeah. watch, he, watch the space for a Liz Truss comeback. I, I think she's self-aware just enough that she won't be coming back as Prime Minister, but she won't all... Anything else out? Goodness me. Well, we haven't heard the last of her. No, and hopefully we won't have heard the last of that because you're back in the 11th, so we'll talk more. <laughs> um, Harry Cole, Pippa Carrera, thank you very much indeed. Here's the weather. So, a stiff northerly wind will keep it cool and unsettled over the next couple of days, although drier than today, but it looks like settling down to end the week. There will be a mostly fine if chilly start tomorrow, with a stiff wind restricting any frost to sheltered Scottish glens, but there will be some showers mainly over Ireland and near England's east coast. Many places then staying dry, good sunny spells through the morning, but Ireland, Wales, southwestern and eastern England and northwest Scotland will see a scattering of blustery showers. Mm -hmm. Well, our press preview continues.